Murder Vivaldi with Glenda Jackson, Dana Elliott and Gwen Watford in a bitter comedy about the relationship of two couples is the David Mercer play in half an hour here on BBC One. The Nine O'Clock News from the BBC with Michael Burke and Philip Hayton. The world's worst oil field disaster, 164 dead. The men who escaped from a shattered platform and a burning sea. The cause, the gas leak that blew Piper Alpha apart. Also tonight, a bomb blast near a swimming pool in Belfast injures six people. The mansion that was the key to the missing millions from Britain's biggest robbery. And three families start test cases against the Cleveland doctors after their children were sent away. Good evening. It's now clear the explosion that ripped a North Sea platform apart was the world's worst oil field disaster. 164 men are almost certainly dead. Only 16 bodies have been recovered. A task force of naval and civilian ships is still searching 700 square miles of sea around the Piper Alpha platform tonight. But with dusk falling now, hope of finding anybody else alive is gone and the search is about to be called off. A short while ago, the American operators, Occidental Oil, said a leak in the gas compression equipment led to a series of massive explosions. Most of the off-duty shift were burnt to death in the accommodation block. Those working had no chance to use the lifeboats, but threw themselves at least a hundred feet into water covered in burning oil. Sixty-eight were brought ashore alive. The Piper platform was one of the oldest, the biggest and most profitable in the North Sea. The explosion split it in two. Tonight the fires in its wreckage are still burning. This report from Clive Ferguson. The day after the explosions and fire which ripped through Piper Alpha, a thick pall of smoke hung over the scene of last night's tragedy. An escape of gas from a compressor is now thought to have brought about the virtual destruction of the platform, riven by the force of a series of blasts. One half has disappeared, all that remains, the severed supporting legs still burning even today. Fears of further flare-ups hampered attempts to deal with the fire and justifiably. The blaze demonstrating its destructive power with flames shooting hundreds of feet into the sky. Ships that had converged here last night today continued their sweeps of the waters. The search now extended to an area around the platform some 20 miles by 34. Tributes were paid to the part played in the search and rescue operation by everyone from warships to tugs to helicopters, even fishing boats. Everyone had tried to save life regardless of risks to their own. But one eyewitness on the nearby support rig, the Tharos, said in spite of it all, the men on Piper Alpha stood no chance. We saw some of the men running up the drill derrick and we saw men waving frantically on the heli deck. And then what happened to them? Well then there was a big explosion a massive big ball of fire and we could no longer even see the heli deck. We were told that men were actually jumping 200 feet into the water. Where we were, it's no use me standing here telling any lies, we couldn't see because of all the flames. But the flames that I'm talking about, I wouldn't doubt that men would jump 200 feet. When they said that we couldn't see, I wouldn't do it at all. What about me, I'd have been doing it. As hope began to fade, the enormity of the human tragedy distressed even the professional rescuers. Because of the job we're doing, you basically try and stay detached. You know it's going to be confusing. You know it's going to be not chaotic. I mean, it's going, yeah, there's going to be a lot of confusion. And you know that, really, you're going to get there. People are going to say, right, we've got a Nimrod there who's got the communications now. And everybody's going to start talking to you. So you tend to detach yourself from the actual incident and concentrate on the job. And the job is trying to efficiently organise the assets you've got, really to save as many people as possible. So it's, it's probably won't be till later on today that I'll actually think about the, almost the human side of it, because we're more concerned with the, the, 
the very personal side when we get there. So you stay detached to get the job done efficiently. Although the cause of the accident may have been a gas leak, the platform's owners, Occidental, remained shocked that the result was so catastrophic that the men had no time to use any planned means of escape. Our men uh, would always wish and hope to be evacuated by helicopter. Uh, that was plainly impossible. Um, to the best of my knowledge, no men evacuated by lifeboat. And, uh, and that is uh, an aspect of the, of the situation that we will obviously want uh, to get a very much better understanding. Those who work on the platforms and rigs have long learned to treat the North Sea's hostility with respect, but for a long time to come, last night will cast a tragic shadow over these waters. The men who died on the Piper Alpha platform were in the living quarters. The men who lived were up and about working. Many of them had to jump 200 feet into a burning sea to escape. One of them said it was over the side or die. Not one of them had time to get into a lifeboat. 23 of the survivors are tonight in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary suffering from burns and broken limbs. The condition of two of them is described as serious. Michael McMillan has spoken to some of the survivors and those who are caring for them. Aberdeen's medical teams worked throughout the night. There was no shortage of volunteers to tend the helicopter rescue shuttle. They were prepared to handle several hundred survivors, but the operation they'd rehearsed so many times could help only 67. This man was exhausted after an escape which involved him jumping 200 feet from the platform into the sea. At Aberdeen's Royal Infirmary, where 23 men are still in hospital, families waited for news, and survivors recounted their ordeal. How did you escape? Jump off the paper deck. You jumped onto the water? Yeah. What happened then? I was in the water for a bit, and then got picked up and stand by this. What did you see? Flames. <laughs> The inferno and the smoke was so much that the people, they tried all the exit doors from the accommodation to get out onto the rigs and get into the water or the boats or whatever. But, you know, they were beaten back at every, at every opportunity. Leave it, leave it, the jib of a crane, you know, toppled, and that made a bridge, you know, that we could get along to the edge and jump into the water from there. You know, it was fry or jump, so it was jump. Mr. Mochan, who's from Glasgow, suffered burns to his hands. He says lessons can be learned and that they hadn't access to equipment to fight the fire. Control room, which is the nerve centre, went down right away, which operates fire pumps and all types of things from remote control positions. And when it was blown to smithereens, the fire pumps were out of the game, you had no water to fight it with. Occidental Oil, the owners of the Piper Alpha platform, said tonight they believed they'd pinpointed leaking gas as the cause of the first explosion. The company said initial investigations had shown there'd been a leak from a gas compression chamber directly underneath the living quarters. This seemed to have set off a series of explosions. Piper Alpha is one of the older platforms in the North Sea. Oil production first started in 1976. The platform itself weighs 34,000 tonnes. It could accommodate up to 240 crew. Just how large it is can be shown in this comparison with Big Ben. Our science correspondent, James Wilkinson. The Piper platform was inaugurated 12 years ago by the then Energy Secretary, Tony Benn. It's a huge steel structure fixed to the seabed, standing in 500 feet of water. The oil is produced like this. The hot gas and oil mixture comes up from under the sea to the well head in pipes called risers. At the top, the mixture is separated. The oil is pumped ashore along one pipeline. The gas is then compressed, again to be sent ashore. This evening, the company said the first explosion occurred due to an escape of gas in the place where the gas is compressed. This seems to have triggered other explosions in quick succession near the living quarters. Eleven years ago, the Piper platform was converted so it could recover gas as well as oil. Before then, the excess gas was wasted and burnt. 
the gas equipment has had problems before. Four years ago, it suffered an explosion and fire. The platform was shut down and the men evacuated. On that occasion, the fire was put out in just over two hours. The gas is mainly methane, often flared from platforms. A mixture of air and gas containing only 4% of methane is highly explosive. The smallest spark could set it off. Whatever happened last night, the men aboard had little time to escape. So how could evacuation be improved? Certain novel features should be considered again, copied perhaps from other systems. For, ex for example, escape chutes, uh, not only near the accommodation units, sited at other areas, so that you go skidding down into a reception system. The reception system could be a craft, or it could be a, a small deck from which a craft could be obtained. The rig is now devastated. The fire is still burning, and it's thought some oil is still leaking out. The Queen has sent a message of heartfelt sympathy to the injured and bereaved. She also praised the bravery of the rescue services in preventing even greater loss of life. Mrs Thatcher told a sombre House of Commons that it was an enormous tragedy. We all wish to express our deep sympathy with the people concerned those who have been injured and the bereaved of the very, very many whom we seem to have lost. May I fully endorse the Prime Minister's sympathy for those who have lost loved ones and those who have been injured in the horrific accident in the North Sea oil field. And may I also join with her in commending those who have shown bravery and skill in the rescue services. Tonight, the chairman of Occidental Oil, Armand Hammer, extended his sympathy to the families of the dead. He said, we will continue to do everything we can to assist the injured and their families. Today, all parties applauded the government's decision for an immediate inquiry, though there's been criticism of the present structures for monitoring safety in the oil business. Peter Main reports. The Energy Secretary emerged from today's Cabinet meeting saying there would be a deep and very far-reaching public inquiry into the Piper Alpha disaster. Later, he refuted labour accusations that North Sea accidents were increasing because of cutbacks on inspections and maintenance. I don't think uh, there have been cutbacks at all. In fact, if you look at the accident figures for uh, North Sea, you'll find that 1986 there were 101 serious accidents. 1987 there were 59. And there were 6,000 more people working because the North Sea was more active in 87 than it was in 86. Now, this doesn't suggest to me a lessening of uh, uh, concern about safety. But Labour's energy spokesman took a different view of the figures. I'm bound to say some of the cutbacks in safety, the cutbacks in safety and maintenance, which has been reported to the House of Commons Select Committee, do show why the figures since 1984 and 85, 86 have doubled in the amounts of incidents, so I would have thought the evidence is quite clear. It's not as it could be, and it's worse than it was, and that needs attention. The Energy Department is responsible for North Sea oil production and safety. At least once a year, government officials inspect the health and safety aspects of all British rigs, including their working methods, the accommodation arrangements, fire pumps and survival craft, and the helicopter deck. Such a check was carried out on the Piper Alpha rig just nine days ago. Lloyd Chipping certify the structural fitness of the platforms. They carry out their own spot checks, including underwater corrosion tests, every year. And every five years, they carry out even more thorough inspections. The last five-year check on the Alpha Piper was two years ago. There's been criticism of the system. In a government report, this union official called for a safety inspectorate, specially for the offshore oil industry. And I said then, I said it in the report, the report speaks very clearly in black and white that life, that danger, that fatality could be involved in this kind of lack of independence. As the investigation into the Piper Alpha disaster begins, the Energy Secretary is now being asked to publish the findings of an inquiry into an explosion on the platform four years ago, in which four men were slightly hurt. The human cost of last night's tragedy makes it a national disaster, but industry and the economy will also suffer. Insurance losses could be more than half a billion pounds. The loss of the Piper field and the shutdown of nearby fields has cut North Sea production by more than a tenth, and world oil prices have gone up in response. It could have an impact on the balance of payments deficit as well. 
as our industrial editor Martin Aidney reports. Before its destruction, the Piper field was producing about 125,000 barrels a day, worth about one and a half million pounds. Other nearby fields used the same pipeline to the Orkneys, including Claymore, Scarpa, Tartan, Highlander and Petronella. They are now shut down too, with the loss altogether of about 300,000 barrels a day, about a tenth of North Sea production. Experts hope that these rigs will be able to pipe oil again in the next fortnight, using the same pipeline. The industry says it's even conceivable that using rigs laid up because of the recession, some production might be restarted from Piper within nine months. It'll mean another blow to Britain's trade balance, already running a loss of about £4.7 billion. The cutback of Piper oil is likely to increase that by perhaps £300 million this year. But that, unlike the human loss, is recoverable. Today has shown what a high price can be paid for the oil which is keeping our economy going. It's now nearly 24 hours since the explosion which ripped the oil platform apart. In Aberdeen, with the latest on the search operations, our reporter Michael McMillan. Michael, is there no hope uh, now that any of the 148 men still unaccounted for might be found alive? Well, I think they're going through the motions. The search will end in about an hour's time. It will start again at first light. But certainly the hospital is not optimistic. It has called off its emergency standby operation and uh, says, quite frankly, it does not expect to treat any more survivors. So the search is due to be called off at 10 o'clock. Will it be resumed at all tomorrow? And will the people resuming it uh, actually have any hope at all of finding anybody alive? Well, it will resume at first light. Uh, uh, a massively scaled down from what it was originally today when 37 ships were involved in it. But as I said before, I think they are going through the motions. Uh, perhaps now they're looking for bodies rather than survivors. Approaching the scene of the disaster early this morning, a thick column of smoke was rising thousands of feet into the air above the blazing platform. The oil and gas escaping from the crippled rig were still burning fiercely. A 15-mile exclusion zone has been imposed around the site. Inside that zone, a string of ships combed the area looking for any survivors. The whole superstructure of the platform has collapsed in a tangle of molten metal. A rescue boat that got too close was engulfed in the flames. One survivor was picked out of the sea more than a mile and a half away from the burning platform, but the chances of the rescue services finding anyone else alive are getting more remote with each hour that passes. If any men who jump from the rig are still in the water, it's unlikely that they could survive such a long period of immersion. I was on the 20-foot level and there was a massive explosion, great balls of flame. So I, I jumped into the sea because the uh, rescue boat moved away, otherwise it would have been burnt with all the people. From about 25 miles away, yeah, we, we could see the flames and uh, obviously as we got closer, I appreciated the magnitude. Um, the, fl the flames really were huge and uh, quite remarkable. What about the heat? The heat obviously uh, wasn't until we got a lot closer, but uh, you could feel the heat quite, quite clearly, in fact, uncomfortably clearly. Oh. Basically, they had very little notice about it. The explosion happened and they weren't able to launch any of their escape vessels or, or life rafts and were committed really to, uh, to escaping from a rig by simply leaping from some 200 feet into the water. The rescue services coordinated from this control room have been working around the clock. But they now fear only bodies will be recovered from the water. The sheer scale of the disaster became apparent to them when the first helicopters carrying the injured began landing at Aberdeen's Royal Infirmary. Some were just suffering from shock and were able to walk from the helicopters. Others arrived on stretchers and were taken straight into intensive care. At first light, the fleet of helicopters were still bringing in the injured. The ordeal of the disaster had completely numbed them. The worst cases were the burn victims caught in the intense heat of the explosion. The anguish of the relatives crowded into the hospital was clear as they waited desperately for news of those posted as missing. Nurses battled throughout the day to bring relief to the survivors, most of them suffering from horrific burns. Eleven of the most seriously injured will undergo skin graft operations in the next 24 hours. Some of the patients, though, were well enough to be able to talk about their experiences on the platform. Uh, within about five minutes, 
you know, the, the inferno and the smoke was so much that the people, they tried all the exit doors from the accommodation to get out onto the rig and get into the water or the boats or whatever. But, you know, they were beaten back at every, at every opportunity. You know, so eventually, myself and about a dozen guys uh, tried a place that we got out that had previously been blocked, you know, with smoke. The decision was made for me, it was roasting. You know, it was fry or jump, so it was jump. A specialist team of plastic surgeons was flown in. They worked with the victims of the Bradford fire and know the problems ahead. If the grafts take, they'll at least be healed uh, in, within two weeks. They will then have um, many months of rehabilitation. Um, the problem with burns is it's a slowly evolving situation. And um, the problem, the psychological problems come later, I think. Distraught relatives and friends left the hospital when it became clear that no more survivors were being brought in. The last man taken alive from the scene arrived here just before nine o'clock this morning. They went home to share their grief in private. Tonight, more than 24 hours after the first explosions ripped through the Piper Alpha platform, the fierce flames have been damped down. The melancholy search for the bodies is still going on, and a pall of black smoke still hangs over the platform, marking the site of the world's worst ever oil field disaster. David Chater, News at 10, in the North Sea. The fire on board the Piper Alpha platform has broken out again. These pictures were taken at the scene of the disaster just two hours ago. Half of the platform has been completely destroyed by the explosion. Air Sea Rescue helicopters are still inside the exclusion zone, but there's now little hope of finding any survivors. The task is now one of finding bodies. A fleet of NATO ships is still on station but the operation is expected to be scaled down tomorrow. The water around the rig is littered with wreckage. The tattered remains of the personal effects of the people on board the rig have been carefully collected. A team of investigators is expected to be flown out to the scene tomorrow. David Chater, News at 10 in the North Sea.